Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Volpe, a partner at Index Ventures, and welcome back to another segment of our AI Summit. Um, today, we are incredibly privileged to have Kate Metz join us in real life. Uh, Kate's been a good friend of ours. He really doesn't need much of an introduction to the AI community, uh, but I will give him one anyway. Um, he is currently a reporter um, at the New York Times, and he covers uh, a lot of segments that involve AI everything from obviously artificial intelligence and machine learning, driverless cars, robotics, virtual reality, and a bunch of other sort of emerging areas. Uh, before the New York Times, he was a reporter at Wired, and before that, he was at the Register. And we really wanted to talk to him today because he's written what we think is one of the seminal books in AI called uh, Genius Makers. Uh, which is really the story about the emergence of AI about all the way back from the post-war 1950s period to today. And in the process of that, he had an innumerable number of conversations uh, with some of the brightest and most capable people um, in the world of AI, some of which we even have uh, here joining us as guests at the AI Summit. And so he's joining us to kind of share with us some of the narrative, his stories, and everything that he's learned in the process of uh, writing his book. So, Cade, welcome. Thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start off with um, the the motivation behind writing this book. Uh, yeah, I think you and I met uh, when you had already been in, writing a number of articles in the New York Times uh, about AI. Uh, but something motivated you to go back and sort of understand the history of this and uh, why we came about to what we were. So talk to us a little bit to start with what your motivation was in, in writing the book. Well, it was a circuitous route, but there was there was a key moment when it began, which um, people may or may not be familiar with. But in 2016, this AI lab in London called DeepMind, which had been acquired by Google, built a machine to play the ancient game of Go, which is a lot like the, the Eastern version of chess, only it's far more complicated. And it's a game that's so complicated that most people in the AI field, most people in the Go world, which is a, a, a national sport in countries like Korea and Japan and China. If you're here in the US, you may not understand how important this game is to other cultures, but it's not something that anyone in the Go world or the AI world thought could be cracked by a machine anytime soon. Most people thought it'd be decades before you could build a computer that could beat the world's best players at the game of Go. And, and that's because the best players play by intuition. Unlike in chess, where you can sort of map out what you're going to do, map out how the game's going to go, you often play by feel, the best players will tell you. It's, they play with, with intuition. If you're gonna build a machine that can beat the best players of the game and go, you need to at least mimic that sort of intuition, which seemed undoable in 2016. Well, this lab called DeepMind um, built a machine to do that very thing. And they took it to Seoul, South Korea to play the best Go player of the past decade, a guy named Lee Seedle. And what I tell everyone is that even though I was just a bystander, I wasn't a participant. I was just watching a reporter writing about this. It was one of the most amazing weeks of my life, mm. period. And a lot of it was about the technology, but a lot of it was about the people who built the technology. Um, the, the founders of DeepMind and the engineers who worked there were fascinating people, separate from what they had built. And then you had an entire country, Korea, focused on this match. Um, and it was an emotional match as the machine beat Lee Seedle in this three out of five um, game match. And, and then, you know, in a twist, Lee Seedle came back to beat the machine in one game. And you could feel the emotions of an entire country, you know, sway back and forth with the game. And as I was flying back to the US, I resolved to write a book. And it would really be about the people who built this machine. And we're continuing to take those ideas and move them in, into industry and move them into some of the biggest companies on earth, Google included. Yeah. So that was the seed of it. Yeah. I knew after that that there was a book in this. Yeah. And, you know, obviously that's a moment that a lot of us that are involved in this business remember. It, you know, it is a seminal moment in the evolution of, of AI. 
Um, but obviously the origins of this technology go many decades before that. And you, you construct that in the book. So tell us a little bit about how you develop the narrative of the book. How, how did you kind of decide to construct it to get to the point where Lisa Dole gets beat? So that was what was so interesting to me is that originally the book was about the deep mind folks. And like I said, they are, they are incredibly fascinating people, but what you realize as you step back from what they have done is that they are building on decades uh, of, of work and research of others. As I started to think about the book, the center of gravity shifted from those folks who were of a certain generation to a much older generation and a guy named Jeff Hinton, who has worked on this one idea that's at the heart of that Go machine at the heart of so many technologies that are coming to the fore now. The idea of a neural network, yeah. which dates back to the 50s. And Jeff Hinton really embodied uh, the struggle to realize that idea over the decades. He first embraced it as a graduate student at the University of Edinburgh in 1971, mm -hmm. at a time when literally most of the world did not believe in it. He embraced it, and over the decades, as, as opinions about this idea would kind of ebb and flow, and mostly, you know, uh, no one believed in this idea, uh, except at, you know, a few moments along the way, he continued to work on it. And that became the thread for the book, right? This one idea, which was finally realized in about 2012, and is powering so many of the technologies that are important to us today, it became a book about the people who struggled to realize that one idea. Yeah. So a couple of questions related to that. First on the people aspect of it. What do you think, you know, you talk about uh, Jeff Hinton, you talk about Jan LeCun, some of the pioneers. What was it about them that gave them the sort of fortitude to continue to pursue an idea which, as you said, at the time was largely academically at least discredited? What is it about them? Well, um, it's, it's a personality trait that I, I admire. Not just believing in something, but enjoying something, even though the rest of the world is telling you you shouldn't, right? There's something noble about that. Um, whatever, whatever field you're in, right? Um, if you're a writer, uh, a reporter, you know, if you're a venture capitalist, right? Um, you know, certainly if you're uh, an AI researcher, Jeff Hinton in particular, um, believed in, in this idea, right? This idea that you could build, and this is an ambitious idea, certainly it was in 1971, build a mathematical system that behaved like um, the web of neurons in the brain. That's what captured him um, as, as a graduate student way back then. And it's what he personally and fundamentally wanted to work on. And it did not matter what the rest of the world was doing. It still doesn't matter. He believes in that idea and, and the power of it. Um, it, it it's, it's something that I admire, but it also makes for a great story, right? There's so many great stories that are like that, right? Yeah. People who believe in an, idea, in an idea, even though most of the world does not. And as you, you know, obviously this discredited, you know, somewhat niche idea of the mimicking the human brain through math mathematical models, um, at some point turned into something that worked, right? It's obviously a, a beat Lisa at all, and we all know that AI is used broadly. What were the things that shifted around it to make this sort of somewhat obscure idea turn into more of a reality? Two basic things happened. Um, one is that we had the data needed to make this idea work and the computer processing power. So a neural network you know, in its simplest form is a mathematical system that can learn a task by analyzing data. You know, whenever I talk about this, to explain it to anyone who's not familiar, is, is if you take thousands of cat photos, feed them into a neural network, it analyzes those photos, pinpoints patterns uh, in those images uh, that define what a cat looks like. In that way, that system can learn to recognize a cat. Okay, you need data. Turns out you need a lot of data, particularly if you're moving beyond cats and you're going into, into other areas. And then you need the processing power needed to analyze that data. 
Uh, back in 1971, when Hinton embraced the idea, we didn't have that. We didn't have it in the 80s, didn't have it in the 90s. By 2012, when there was an inflection point, um, we, we had both, right? We had the data basically because of the internet, right? It made it easy to collect that data. A lot of the data was shared by individuals like you and me and everybody else on earth. Yeah. Um, but it was easy to collect. But we also had the processing power. Um, people figured out that um, strangely enough, graphics chips that are in you know, game consoles and in your computers and render graphics, that could be applied uh, to th these neural networks and the training of these systems. Those two things came together and it, it came together in Jeff Hinton's lab. Um, and there's this key moment where uh, he and two of his students build a system that can recognize images with an accuracy that was never possible before. And that's really when things shifted and the so world woke up to this. The uh, ImageNet contest that that's they right. uh, were very successful in. As you survey that sort of uh, 20, 30 year history of the evolution of neural networks, there's obviously the Jeff Hinton part of the story. Anything else that sort of, as you were doing the research, kind of caught you by surprise and you were like, hmm, I didn't expect that. Or this is sort of an unusual twist to the story. Well, um, what, what I knew on some level, but continue to surprise me, was how tiny the community was and how interesting these people were. Jeff Hinton, you know, in addition to everything we've talked about technically, um, he is, he could be the most amazing person I've ever met, just personally. The guy, I mean, he literally does not sit down for one thing. He's had this longstanding back problem. And so I, I can't tell you, uh, the the amazement um, and and the and the in, like internal excitement I had when he told me that um, you know despite this back problem he and Google and Alan Eustace who uh, you know was the head of engineering essentially at Google found a way despite this back problem to secretly fly him you know across the Atlantic to London to vet D DeepMind before Google bought them. That, that's it. like, it, it's such an amazing moment where they have to like physically, you know, Rube Goldberg style, you know, get him into this plane so he can take off and land, um, you know, without sitting down, yeah. which he does not do. Th those types of moments were astonishing. And what I found is that they were all, all those moments were interconnected. Like it's such a tiny group of people at various points, but certainly, you know, in the AI field as a whole, but certainly that that neural network idea was centered around a tiny, tiny group of people. And as I found more and more moments like that, it was amazing how it all interconnected, yeah. right? It, because it was such a small community. Yeah, yeah. Okay, as you, as we've observed in, in the evolution of, of the AI technology, I feel like there's sort of a polarization of views on its impact uh, on the world. You have, uh, on the one end, people that, you know, talk about the robocalypse and how this technology is going to extinguish humanity and its moral implications and all that. And on the other hand, you have people who kind of, I wouldn't say trivialize it, but, you know, it's a little better than statistics. But, you know, we've been doing this for a while and it's fine. And by the way, really only people like Google can use it. It's not going to mainstream and so forth. So as you see the, the story of this evolve over the years, what's your perspective on this sort of extreme polarization that exists uh, on the views around the impact that AI has on, on us and on our society. Well, I'm not going to deny it. Even as a reporter, it's hard to reconcile those two things. Um, you know, as this revolution, let's call it, started to happen, you know, in the early 2010s, um, even as a reporter, you're talking to these, these types of people um, constantly. It's hard to understand what is happening. There are people who have such belief in the technology, right, and are so convinced that it is about to um, to reach a point where, um, you know, the 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 apocalypse is possible, right? Um, it's hard to reconcile that with these other things. And you're not inside those labs, right? These are very large companies, um, and it's difficult to get information out of them. What I realized, though, and I think that this is a key part of the book, there's a there's a, a chapter near the end, which is called religion. And I think it's important to understand that on one side of it, that belief that AGI, as it's called, artificial general intelligence, a machine that can do anything the human brain can do, which might bring about 
that uh, apocalypse that you talk about, that extreme view, it's, it's like a religion, right? It's, it's, it's an extreme belief. And there's technology behind it, and the technology is progressing, but we don't necessarily know how to get to that end that they're talking about. They don't know, right? But in order to get there, you better believe it, right? It's like anything else. You know, if, if you're going to make an investment, you know, you, you, you don't make it half-heartedly. You know, you're, you're, you have to believe in it. Yeah. So on some level, you understand that belief, but it can be so confusing. And once you realize that even the people who are saying that don't know how to get to where they want to go, that makes it easier to understand what's going on. These are, this is math, right? A neural network is math fundamentally but it can be powerful. And what we've seen is that even though we're a long way from that apocalypse, this technology is already very powerful in certain ways. It's already done great things in certain ways. It's already caused problems in, in certain ways. And it's not the apocalypse, but we, we're we already dealing with, with issues um, with those technologies. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, you know, you, you talked about how data made a big difference in the development of this, a collection of large amounts of data. Um, and essentially, you're kind of combining a lot of data with a mathematical process that mimics the human mind. So one of the things that I think about in my spare time is that, you know, uh, it, our neural networks, especially as you start evolving towards AGI, just like humans. And you know, we as humans have good and bad habits, and we do good and bad things. And uh, can we expect it to mirror us, or is the evolutionary path? You know, in talking to all these people that you know, is the evolutionary path of AI something that ends up being superhuman, like different than us in some ways, right? So, do we land in a place where it's similar to us, or it's actually quite different and potentially threatening, or maybe better than us? It's it's well, first of all. As it exists today, it's very different from us, right? This, this idea that we can build a system that behaves like the brain, that's just a rough analogy at this point. Like a neural network doesn't really uh, behave like our brain. We don't know how our brain works. That's one thing that people miss. The brain is a mystery. And if we don't understand our brain, we can't really recreate it. This is a loose approximation of how the brain works. And, um, you know, in this case, it's really just a mathematical system that analyzes the data. But I think what you said there, that, that these systems end up mirroring us, I think that's a good way to think about it because the data comes from us, right? We create the data uh, when we post it to the internet, whether it's images, sounds, uh, text, all that is used to train um, these models. Uh, and we have people who are choosing, curating that data, deciding, you know, out of all that data that's been posted on the internet, what data do we use to, to train this particular technology? That is going to reflect humanity, right? It's going to reflect the people who posted the data. It's going to reflect the people who have chosen you know, out of all, the, all, all that information, which pieces of it to actually use. It's gonna reflect the points of view of humans. And that is what we're, we're seeing, right? These are not systems that are sentient. They don't, they are, in one sense they learn by themselves, but they're learning with help from humans and they end up reflecting the beliefs of those. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of the more modern system, all the GPT work that OpenAI and so forth are doing, they train on the whole internet. Well, yeah, but um, but the the creators have control um, over the system. Okay, so it's is it's the whole internet in a sense, right? It's we think of the whole internet. I mean, you, you, you were born in Italy. I think of the whole internet as the American internet, the English internet, right? So you're choosing the English internet and, and that's gonna reflect um, a certain point of view, right? Um, you, could, you could train a model on the entire internet, which would be all, all different languages. Um, you, you make these choices, right? You, you limit the scope, you expand, you expand the scope. 
the thing to remember is that, and this is where the problems come in, is that we as humans cannot wrap our heads around all that data, okay? Yeah. So the machine can take advantage of all that data, what's called the American internet, and right? And it can find the patterns in, in all that data and make use of them. We cannot do that. What it means is we can't understand everything that the machine is learning, right? We make these choices, but in the end, we don't really know what it's learning because we can't learn in the same way. Yeah. We can't see everything that's in that in that data, right? It's a mystery in some yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, no, super interesting. Um, okay, so on the evolution of the technology, which sort of in some ways is gonna mirror your journalistic path right. now and into the future, there've been some pretty seminal moments, right? There's, uh, you know, the original neural network work, all the back propagation stuff, the ImageNet moment, the AlexNet moment in 2012. Most recently in 1718, there's a lot around transformers and attention, um, also done by a lot of Jeff Hinton's work. Um, are we are we through with all the big stuff or do you expect some other sort of big breakthrough moments to occur in the coming years? Well, um, I think you've hit on the interesting areas where there's still progress, right? So. In the GPT-3 area, these, these models that train on enormous amounts of data, we haven't seen the end of that, right? And that's as we throw more and, and sometimes different data at these models, they get better and better and better. And, and you've seen that with um, you know, specific progress uh, projects. So GPT-3 uh, was designed to you know, train on this enormous amounts of, of data and learn general natural language. And what, what we discover from that is that you know, if you throw the whole internet at it, um, it can learn how to write a computer program, at least a simple computer program. Yep. Okay. And now we're taking specifically large amounts of computer programs, feeding that into similar models and, and seeing where that goes. Right. So there's still work to be done in that area. And there's still, it seems, progress to be made. It seems like eventually you know, we're going to run out of juice there. Right. And so then the question becomes, you know, where do you go next? Because these models aren't perfect. You know, if you roll the dice 10 times, it'll give you five great speeches. It'll give you five that are garbage, right? And so that, that's the thing. And it's unclear if we can get to the point where it's perfect. And that's when the world really changes. When you can produce a tweet or a, an article or, or a like that's perfect. Now, we don't know how to get there. And even the creators of GPT-3 and it's a successor codex, open AI, right? You know, they don't necessarily know how to get there. And, and they've said to me and to others, you know, that, that they think they're gonna run out of juice with this particular method. So then it's, so what's next, right? But um, there's a lot of juice in, in other areas. Like I know that you're focused on, on, on robotics and a lot of these same ideas are helping to drive machines that can learn tasks, yeah, yeah. right? Physical tasks. Um, and, and that's a powerful thing. And I think that's another area where there's a lot of work to be done. How, how secure do you feel in your profession at this point with the machines getting better and better? Well, it, it, people <laughs> they, they often ask me that. I feel, you know, having used GPT-3, I feel, I feel confident. Pretty good. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know about my job, you know, maybe the machines have picked the companies. I don't know, I don't know. You know, I, I think there was all this talk for so many, you know, so many years about, AI taking away our jobs. And uh, the reality is something very different, right? And, it, and I've written a lot about this recently that most of these technologies that are working are complementary to people um, or they're you know, in areas where we need, you know, we need the labor, right? Um, whether it's you know, robots in the warehouse or trucks driving stuff across the country, like that's stuff we're dealing with even more today because of the pandemic and we need the technology to work. And if you just look at my, my job, what humans are good at doing is dealing with the uncertainty in the world, the chaos, the unexpected, mm -hmm. right? I don't know what questions you're gonna ask me um, in the moment here and I can respond to it. And you know, I may not do a perfect job, but I can do a better job than a machine. And that's that's the difference. Um, you know, the the machine can recognize patterns, and sometimes it gets it right. 
but it can't deal with something that's never seen before. And that's the problem with self-driving cars or, or robotics or whatever else is that, you know, when something new and different happens, I can deal with it and the machine cannot. It's getting better, Yeah, but it's not there yet. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not worried. You're feeling pretty good. Okay. Um, switching subjects a little bit. Obviously, a lot of this work in researching AI is expensive. It costs a lot of money and uh, it requires a lot of data. And we all know that the bigger tech companies in our industry, the Googles, the Microsoft, the Baidus, the Facebooks, have both a lot of money and a lot of data. Is your sense, well, a couple of things. First of all, not all of those companies responded in the same way to the advent of AI. Somebody, some of them embraced more or less. And I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, why? Why did somebody just, some people just get it and other people didn't? But now that they kind of all get it, does AI become the domain of their universe? Is it something, is a technology that they will have a monopoly over? Or uh, is it more able to be democratized to a broader set of companies or users in the world? Well, um, I think it's a little bit of both, and that's not always the most satisfying answer, but certainly the processing power and the data is inside these companies, right? And they, and they have an advantage. But something interesting happened as this technology was coming to the fore, and this is a big part of my book, is that people like Jeff Hinton were academics. People like Yang LeCun were academics, and they believed in freely sharing their research. And as they moved into industry, they brought that belief with them. Mm -hmm. And were, because the, the technology was so valuable, they were able to impart that belief and in some ways um, infuse the companies with that belief. So even though um, Google, for instance, or, and Facebook, you know, they're the ones with the processing power uh, and the data and the talent, they are at least sharing the, the technological ideas, right? Those advances with the world in the form of research papers, which were freely shared all the time across the globe. And, and so what you see is that even though those companies have a huge advantage today, there's no denying it. And there are real issues with that. You've alluded to them. In the long term, those technologies are trickling down to others. And so what might seem like a massive model today that you um, as a small company or as a small researcher do not have access to, in the long term, it, it, kind, of, it kind of trickles down. Um, yeah. But there's still an imbalance there. I mean, there's no yeah. denying that's a real concern. What's actually kind of fascinating about this industry as a sidebar, because of what you're talking about, is that even competitors are quite collegial. You know, in a lot of other work that we do as venture capitalists, the you know competitors really don't like each other. Yes. But in AI, they're like, ah, you know, we're doing, you know, we're competing with each other, but they're very friendly. They, they go off for have a beer, they chat. There's sort of the, some of that academic spirit isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like how how that tiny group of people was able to change the way these giant companies behaved. Yeah. Like it's and and this not like a, this is like a minor technology, right? This is important technology um, in a lot of ways, and um, and yet you have that collegial atmosphere you talk about, which is so unusual. Yeah. I mean, people that are directly competing with each other go have a, a, a drink and chat with each other and yes. share ideas yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth. It's very 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 unusual yeah. that way. One, a lot of our audience are founders and, um, you know, the book that you talk about and as you do the research work, the, the people that are involved are more academics that passionately pursued an idea. But there's this common thread of passion and belief and, and conviction, which is something that a lot of founders intuitively, they, they have to have. And you talked about this a little bit earlier about, you know, uh, Jeff's kind of conviction and what he believed in. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit of what are the characteristics of a person that is able to maintain that conviction of the passion that they're working on in the face of adversity? Well, like I said, I, I admire that, that sort of thing. Um, some people have it innately. Right. Um, and no matter what happens around them, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Some people pick it up. Right. Sometimes you pick it up from people around you. And, you know, what I will say is that sometimes you can take it too far. And I think that that's that's one of the things that we're we're dealing with as a society. Um, you know, you talk about the crowd who has talked about the 
the robot apocalypse and 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 really taking this to extremes right it, here in silicon valley as you point out um you have to have that belief but are there are there cases where you where you can take that too far absolutely because i i think that it it can be hurtful if you're not stepping back from that and thinking about you know where things might go wrong how the rest of the world will per perceive this you know i think we all need a realistic understanding of what the technology can do and where it's going to make decisions about how to use it right how to regulate it or not um where, where, where to put it, where, where to not. And that belief, you know, can, can get in the way. Um, but in a lot of ways it's, it's admirable and understandable and, and it has to work that way. Right. Silicon Valley would not advance these technologies if that wasn't part of the culture. Yeah. Well, we certainly have to be optimistic about the stuff that we work <laughs> right. on because we fail more than we succeed. Right. So, right. Um, Okay, so last thing I wanted to ask you, obviously, I'm not gonna ask you to make predictions per se, because that's not what you do, but I know you pursue themes. Yeah. As it pertains to this world of AI, what themes in the last six months or what themes do you expect over the next couple of years to be the most interesting ones that, right, kind of, you, you wrote the book that brought us to today. Yeah. What gives you the twinkle in the eye about the next five years? You know, there, there are basically, when it comes to AI, like three interesting areas um, that I think about a lot. You know, one is the natural language stuff, the GPT-3 stuff that we've talked about. The other one is ro robotics, right? Um, in the warehouse and other areas. And the third, which is a little bit different than the robotics thing is, is, is the self-driving car thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about hard things to, to write about and, and the hard things to even think about. Um, the self-driving car thing is, um, in one sense, it's it continues to progress. Um, you know, these cars are getting better and better. In another sense, it's it's still not as powerful, I think, as a lot of people think that it is. And and that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about because we continue to have an enormous amount of money going into it. You know, the, the number of players is shrinking, but the money you know continues to go in, and that's if it's going to be realized that's what has to has to happen. But what we're going to start to see um, over the next year, maybe more, um, uh, you know, at least, you know, companies are telling us over the next year, we're going to start seeing these services come to fruition in small ways in cities, right? So the, there are tests in San Francisco. Uh, a test was just announced in, in New York City, you know, at the very least, that's an opportunity to see how these cars really behave in real situations. And, um, you know, that's what this story is, is that these things can work in contained situations. You know, how contained are they? When, you know, when do they work? When do they not work? Um, I think that's going to be super interesting yeah. um, and fascinating. So, Kate, on those last two areas that you talked about, um, Robots and cars, they have a similarity, which is that when you think of them um, mimicking human work, it's a lot of things that we do fairly mindlessly. Most people drive reasonably mindlessly. If, if you have a warehouse robot that's moving you know, a package from one shelf to the other, it's pretty mindless. Language is an interesting one because language does capture like how we think as people, you know? and. The, I think you make an interesting point that like cars don't exactly drive just right yet. But, you know, at some level, I also say, yeah, there's corner cases we haven't figured out, but the task really isn't that hard because uh, I can do that and do a lot of other things at the same time. Thinking is a different matter. It's something that really consumes us. Do you think that that means that the language problem will be harder or because it, it, it at least from a human perspective, it takes a lot more work than it does to just drive? Or is that the wrong way to think about that problem? Well, the um, if you look at the self-driving car problem, right, that's complicated because there are lives on the line, right? So yeah. you've got you've got that. Um, but your point about robots in the warehouse, at least, um, you're right, right? It's you know, it's contained. It's um, it doesn't require a lot of thought, so to speak, right? Um, it does become, you know, a sort of a repetitious act. And that's one of the reasons, you know, that we, 
that we need that that sort of thing, right? Not everybody wants to do that job, especially as demand goes up. It's hard in a lot of these warehouses to find the labor that's that's needed there, right? Um, and if you can uh, give people, you know, better jobs in, in other situations, um, that might be a good thing. Um, but I think you're right about language. Um, you know, we're going to continue to see progress, at least for, for a while. And that can be a powerful thing. It'd be an interesting thing. You know, this, this codex system that OpenAI built to write computer programs, you know, it, it can't reason like a human, which means it's going to fall down in places. But the basic tasks that it, that it does that can help human programmers uh, do their thing. And it's the same with something like, like GPT-3. Um, and um, I think it's going to be very, very hard to replicate the reasoning um, that, that you and I have. And, and we don't know how to get there. I mean, fundamentally, right? We don't know how to get there. And so in that sense, it is absolutely a hard problem. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, that, that'll give us another opportunity in the future to come back there you go. and talk about this one more time. Thank you for the great work we do, you do. Like all of us that are in the industry, love sure. reading what you do. And, and uh, you know, the book is definitely seminal uh, for those of us that follow the sector. So it's a pleasure talking to you. Look forward to the next one we get a chance to do. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.